Good morning. Welcome. We are here for Educating for Change, Ensuring Holocaust Remembrance in Washington State. We are streaming live on YouTube right this minute. And so live streaming provides an opportunity for more people to view the webinar. And it'll also be good to know that this recording that is being done will be available on YouTube immediately after today's event. Closed captions are available today. Please just click on the CC icon in the Zoom toolbar. And uh, you can also click on the live transcript uh, option in that button. And sometimes it's hidden under more, which is the ellipses icon. So those are there for you if you should need them at any time. Tips for participation today. We have uh, un we've deactivated the mute and unmute ability and video for today. Uh, it's, it's more of a webinar format, but we do encourage interaction in the chat as we'll be using that for questions for our presenters. And uh, we'll use, also be using that to share resources today as well. At this time, we'd like to ask folks to rename themselves. So if you can click on the participants pane, we'll know who's joining us, uh, please. Uh, click on the uh, more option next to your name, which will be in the participants pane, click rename and enter your name, your role, your organization, as well as your pronouns. Next, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional lands of namely the Nisqually, Puyallup, and Squaxin Island tribes, Coast Salish, Lashootseed speaking peoples. It is an honor beyond any simple description to live in a place imbued with such deep meaning and connection. I would like to pay my deepest and humblest respects to the Coast Salish elders and their teachings, which are carried on generation to generation, hand to hand, by the elders and their descendants and their descendants' descendants. We must reflect and cherish these precious gifts from those whom have passed, those who continue to live, and those who are yet to be born. On this slide here, I've captured a detail of the seeded and unseeded lands map. Here you can see in pink, where I mainly travel in life, the organic and living borders of the indigenous peoples of this land. I've never been so thankful to live somewhere where the towering cedars, powerful salmon, and cackling ravens surround me. It's such a gift. We ask that each of the participants of this meeting also honor the tribal lands on which each of you are located today. So please use the chat box at this time to do so. Best practice is for districts to engage in tribal consultation with the tribes nearest their district to determine their historical lands. Each tribe are the experts of their history. As individuals, I ask and plead of you, learn their stories, hear their voices in song, and let their art transform you. Form relationships and become acquainted. Thank you for joining us. Next, I'd like to bring us into a time and space of intention before we get started with some of our other webinar content. On behalf of OSPI, I'd like to ask that we take a moment of silence to reflect on the uncertainty we feel during this time of unrest. We would like to acknowledge the pain and trauma resulting from over 400 years of racism in the United States. I want to acknowledge the pain, anger, and confusion we all feel about the future for our communities and families of color and for education. We stand with our communities of color and those who identify as and or are categorized as Black African American. We will now have a 60 seconds moment of silence. I'm going to set my timer and then we'll continue on with our webinar. Thank you for taking that moment with me. And I encourage anybody to share resources, thoughts, and feedback into the chat. Um, that'll be there for you throughout today's presentation. Next, to share our vision, mission, and values. Our vision is that all students are prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. 
Our mission to transform K-12 education to a system that is centered on closing on opportunity gaps and is characterized by high expectations for all students and educators. We achieve this by developing equity-based policies and supports that empower educators, families, and communities. We have four values at OSBI, ensuring equity, collaboration, and service, achieving excellence through continuous improvement, and the focus on the whole child. Next for OSPI's equity statement, each student, family, and community possesses strengths and cultural knowledge that benefit their peers, educators, and schools. Ensuring educational equity goes beyond the quality. There is a difference. It requires education leaders to examine the ways that current policies and practices result in disparate outcomes for our students of color, students living in poverty, students receiving special education in English learner services, students who identify as LGBTQ+, and highly mobile student populations. It requires education leaders, all of us in this space, to develop an understanding of the historical contexts, engage students, families, and community representatives as partners in decision-making, and actively dismantle systemic barriers, replacing them with policies and practices that ensure all students have access to the instruction and support they need to succeed in our schools. Next, I'd like to invite Daphie Stoltz. She's from our uh, STRIDE group at OSPI to present on this slide. Good morning, Daphie. Good morning, Akiva, and thank you. Um, this is an opportunity just to go over our Brave Space guidelines. We want to welcome multiple viewpoints, stay open to new ideas, and afford others the generous assumptions. Want to own your intentions and your impacts. Take responsibility for the effects of your words. Let the group know if you have a strong reaction to something and be open to dialogue. You want to work to recognize and respect differences. Investigate your own experiences and honor the difference that we all bring. Take risks and lean into discomfort. Challenge yourself to engage even if it's imperfect. Find ways to respectfully challenge others. Be open to challenges of your own views. Think about how to question ideas without personal attacks. You want to step up, step back, share speaking time, actively listen, speak your, uh, after others who have not spoken. Break it down. Use plain talk and provide background when necessary. If you don't know, ask in confidentiality. When you leave, share the message, not the messenger. Thank you. On to you, Akiva. Thank you so much, Daphie. You're welcome. Good to see you. Likewise. Also, I'd like to let folks know again that we are streaming live on YouTube and uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so that you know when new videos are coming out, you will be notified. Uh, and also this recording will be available there on YouTube after the fact. Our objectives for today, at the conclusion of the webinar, participants will have an increased understanding around Holocaust education, state education requirements, RCW 28A 300-115, and required learning and teaching best practices when engaging with the Holocaust. Participants will have an increased familiarity with patterns of bias and hate to recognize and contribute to the prevention of anti-Semitism and other forms of bias and discrimination within learning communities. Participants will be able to recognize and assess needs or deficiencies in Holocaust knowledge and understandings of bias within their learning communities, so to be able to provide necessary education materials and instructional improvements where needed. I'd next like to introduce our presenters who are here with us today. I'll also be introducing them uh, later on. Uh, but here on the call, we have Dee Simon, who is the Barrel Family Executive Director for the Holocaust Center for Humanity. As well, we have Paul Riggelbrook. Teaching and Learning Specialist at the Holocaust Center for Humanity. We uh, have the wonderful gift of having Peter Metzelar here from the Speakers Bureau at the Holocaust Center for Humanity. And then there's myself, Akiva Noach Erzim, Program Specialist of Continuous Improvement at OSSI, OSPI, he, him, his pronouns. I, I'd also like to uh, thank Juwaria Sue of Stride and HR at OSPI for her help in making this event happen, as well as Zach Murphy of OSPI's communication team and he's helping us be on YouTube live at this moment. And then also Tony Brunel, who is our OSPI Zoom administrator, and he's helping facilitate some of the Zoom components here today as well. So thank you. Now we'll begin with the main presentation, Educating for Change, Holocaust, Ensuring Holocaust Remembrance in Washington State. The Holocaust was the dehumanization and industrialized murder of more than 6 million Jewish men, women, and children by the Nazi regime. 
Additionally, there were a combined 11 million victims of other groups throughout the Holocaust era, including Soviet civilians and prisoners of war, not non-Jewish Poles, Serbian civilians, individuals deemed to be disabled, Roma people, Jehovah's Witnesses, members of the LGBT community in an assortment of other political and ideological opponents. The murders were carried out in pogroms, mass shootings, starvations, hard labor, as well as in gas chambers in the back of trucks, and finally at fully fledged extermination camps such as Auschwitz and Treblinka. The persecution began in stages, progressing into a fully operational government program administered from Berlin. The Holocaust represents a period when bias became elevated by government, culture, and society, resulting in widespread devastation and destruction. Survivors are still here with us, so are their children and grandchildren. We must do our part in ensuring it never happens again and that it is never forgotten. Holocaust education is history, literature, social studies, psychology, art, and so much more. It's through studying the Holocaust that all people may learn the importance of critical thinking, speaking out against bigotry and indifference, and taking action in the pursuit of justice. Quick note here on the picture, it's been used in the advertising for today's event. Pictured are Avram, five years, and Emmanuel Rosenthal, two years old. Emmanuel was born in the Kovno ghetto and knew no other life. Both children were deported in the March 1944 Children's Action and neither survived. Their uncle Schreiger Weine, who had asked George Kaddish to take this photograph, received a copy of it from the photographer after the war in the Landsberg Displaced Persons Camp. Over the next couple slides, I'd like to go over some backgrounds for why we're here today. From my perspective, this professional development has come together for three main reasons. A strong commitment to equity and fighting racism taken by our office and myself personally. This should rightfully include the fight against anti-Semitism and racialized violence towards Jews and other groups, such as Sikhs, Armenians, Hellenic peoples, Assyrians, and other ethno-religious groups. Additionally, the Holocaust Center for Huma Humanity represents a flagship in the fight against anti-Semitism, bias, and hate. So it was a natural connection to partner with them, and they've been instrumental in ensuring Holocaust education and remembrance in Washington state and in the region. Secondly, data from the past years and recently indicates a strong need for educator and agency response to ensure people know about the work of the Holocaust Center, as well as the resources, such mm -hmm. as the teaching and learning best practices that are available to educators to fight bias, hate, and violence. This webinar seeks to provide educators with the tools they need. Lastly, the future and well-being of our students and society is at stake. Lack of Holocaust knowledge leads to anti-Semitism, and expressions of anti-Semitism do not just harm the Jewish people. It affects people from all groups. As Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who passed away last year, is quoted with saying, the hate that starts with the Jews never ends with the Jews. It should concern all of us when any one group faces bias, hate, and violence, for this hate will only spread to others. By improving understandings of the Holocaust, we can encourage more critical thinking, media literacy, as well as work toward dismantling structures and barriers that damage people's lives. To speak more on equity, as described by OSPI's equity statement, this concerns the well-being and success of each and every student. Equity is inscribed as the premier point in OSPI's strategic plan, as well as a goal of my specific division, the Office of System and School Improvement. Additionally, it is a personal commitment of mine to address the specific strengths and needs of individuals based on their life conditions, community and family connections, as well as the task of engineering foundations and pathways to rectify past social economic wrongs and otherwise in the pursuit of a just society. Doing work around equity involves dismantling structures that have led and continue to lead to inequitable circumstances. Holocaust education provides an avenue to seeing inequitable structures as they've existed historically and as they emerge, recognizing how attitudes can transform into actions leading to discriminatory policies as well as bias motivated violence and in some cases genocide. Equity work can look like organizational changes, rewriting policies, differentiation of supports and reformatting systems to best meet the need of students, families and communities based on their contexts. Equity work also looks like social work and a lot of self-work as we seek to undo our own unequitable thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that lead to injustices and racist biased policies. An equity lens can also be used to approach academic success and academic outcomes, but that's not its only focus. It can be used to address other dimensions of the school climate, including emotional and physical safety, as well as social sustainability within educational institutions. In the two years I initially worked at OSPI, 
Unfortunately, I never heard anyone mention anti-Semitism or violence towards the Jewish people. For a long time, I felt invisible, and I know I'm not the only one. However, I will say some of the conversation in my office has changed significantly, and fairly recently. I wrote a Dear Colleagues email and began elevating the conversation at the agency, and as well as due to certain recent events that uh, concretized my assertions, the conversation elevated. I'm amazed at the responses and some of the changes I've seen. As a result, I'm thankful to hear some folks talking about anti-Semitism, as well as violence towards Asians and Asian Americans. I've had an overwhelming number of people write me personally in support of the Jewish community in Holocaust education. Like I said, my dear colleague's letter that I wrote in December has been supplemented with the examples of violence we've all seen in the media recently, which gave me and my writing a powerful credence. I'm truly thankful to see that Superintendent Reichdahl put out a statement in solidarity with the Asian American and Jewish American communities in late March, shortly after the Atlanta spa killings. It means a lot to know our agency leadership cares about these issues. And so I'm truly moved by that. Additionally, like I said, data is a large part of why the conversation is happening today. So we'll briefly explore some points in the next three slides. Last year, there were two main data sources that propelled me to take action within my organization and write that email. Firstly, on September 16th, 2021, the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany released a highly publicized representative study of all 50 US states. One of the main takeaways from the study were the shocking data regarding Holocaust knowledge and ignorance across the country. Here are just a few takeaways from that study. 12% of millennials and Gen Z in Washington state believe Jews caused the Holocaust. 34% of millennials and Gen Z in Washington state cannot name a single concentration camp or ghetto from the Holocaust. That number is 50% in Oregon. 58% of millennials and Gen Z in Washington state have seen Holocaust denial or distortion on social media or elsewhere online. After reading and talking about these statistics, my wife and I, we were sleepless. We know that the Holocaust education was not so amazing on the West Coast, but things had gotten this bad, people can truly believe Jews caused the Holocaust. Could we raise our children in a state where there are so many conspiracy theorists, anti-Semites and white supremacists? Would we need to hide their names? This study became a fire within us to do something, to increase understanding, to fight anti-Semitism and to improve the equity conversation. We want to leave a better world than we entered. Other trends that were particularly disturbing were captured by the FBI as well as analyzed by the Anti-Defamation League Pacific Northwest. Not too long after the claims conference study, the ADL PNW released a statement in November of 2020, Washington hate crimes at highest level ever. The headline was in response to the change in data from 2018 to 2019. In Washington state, the hate crime based on race, ethnicity, and origin increased by 11%. In Oregon, the number of hate crimes increased by 49% from the previous year. Nationally, 2019 saw the highest number of reported hate crime murders on record with 51 victims. Nationally, reported hate crimes directed against Jews increased 14%. 63% of the total number of reported religion-based crimes were directed against Jews and Jewish institutions, even though Jews only make up 2% of the country's population. Clear from this data, the situation is unacceptable. We have a lot of work to do. However, I don't just wanna share the data that indicates the problems and current dilemmas. I also have data that reflects hope. From the Echoes and Reflection Survey, a collaborative project of the Anti-Defamation League, the USC Shoah Foundation and Yad Vashem, Israel's International Holocaust Memorial, 1,500 post-secondary students enrolled in four-year colleges and universities in the US were surveyed, revealing positive outcomes. Here are just a few key findings. Not only are students with Holocaust education more likely to report having more tolerant and pluralistic attitudes, they're significantly more likely to report willingness to challenge incorrect or biased information, 28% more likely, to challenge intolerant behavior in others, 12% more likely, and stand up to negative stereotyping, 20% more likely. Additionally, when presented with a bullying scenario, students with Holocaust education reported being more likely to offer help and were 50% less likely to do nothing and stay out of it. This indicates a certain willingness to intervene. Students with Holocaust education were also more significantly likely to provide support to a victim in private, 35% more likely to do so. In addition to the positive findings related to the Holocaust education generally, one teaching modality, the use of video or in-person testimonies like we'll experience today of survivors recounting their lives and 
uh, their experiences during the Holocaust stood out as having the most significant positive impact on students. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. And I encourage you to investigate the results of this survey and data sources I mentioned for you. It's inspiring to see the power of Holocaust education on the lives of students. Next, I'd like to introduce Dee Simon, Barrel Family Executive Director from the Holocaust Center for Humanity for her portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Akiva. Um, at the Holocaust Center, our primary goal is to educate about the Holocaust as a universal lesson for all people, a way of teaching about the past and applying those lessons to today. Students um, see, for example, how propaganda and misinformation led to fear and hate, to thinking of fellow citizens as other, and eventually murder. Through stories of local survivors, we teach history, we teach empathy, and what it means to be an upstander. Akiva, can you share our mission statement? And there it is, I'll give you a minute to read it. Great, and let's move on to the next slide. At the Holocaust Center, we have lots of resources and all of our resources are free to teachers. So how do we get all this work done? How do we accomplish our mission? Um, one of the first things I'd like to point out is our museum, which is at the top right-hand corner, left-hand corner. And you can see the school buses there. Um, before COVID, we would have sometimes two and three school buses a day. Um, we encourage you to come and take a field trip. We have um, a scholarship and a fund for people who um, need support um, for field trips and they'll pay for buses and other, other expenses. Um, because of COVID, if you look at the center bottom picture, we had to take our tours virtual. And so our docents are now giving tours, live tours to classrooms throughout the state. And they're wonderful, wonderful, very interactive, lots of questions. Um, it's, it's a great resource. So I encourage you to look into a virtual field trip for your classes. We also have teaching trunks. Um, these are trunks filled with curriculum, filled with maps and activities for books at different reading levels. We have a elementary fifth, sixth grade trunk, a middle school trunk and a high school trunk. We also have sets of books. So if you need just one book, if you need Anne Frank or if you need Mouse, you can order a classroom set. And again, all of these are free and they're delivered right to your, um, right to your school or your home. We also have a speakers bureau, and um, one of my coworkers will talk more about the speakers bureau later. But we have 30 people who go out to schools. They're survivors, there's children of survivors, and grandchildren of survivors. We also have a writing, art, and film contest for students or for teachers who want to take it a step further. And most importantly, we have professional development. So throughout the year, you can go to our website and find programs that will help you teach this subject. And, and some people think it's daunting, it's such a big topic, but we make it simple. We have you know, Holocaust 101 classes. We have on May 6th, there's a class on um, practical tools for teaching the Holocaust. On June 29th, um, we have an all day workshop. It's called A Day of Learning and lots of classes and lots of ways to connect and to really engage with teaching these lessons. We also have traveling exhibits. So I invite you to bring a traveling exhibit to your classroom or to your school library. And then in the, in the bottom right hand corner, we have a picture of our ambassadors, excuse me, our um, educators for change. And these are um, 24 educators who are really informing us about our curriculum, about our best practices. They're telling us how much time teachers have or what challenges teachers are facing out there. And so they inform our work, they inform our resources, and they really um, guide us in making our work fit into your day and into your class curriculums. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit, and Akia, you can move it to the next slide. Um, and I think Akiva mentioned this, in 2019, we passed uh, legislation that encourages Holocaust education. And I wanna just tell you a little bit about how this came about. Um, it was a teacher, and you can see she's just behind the uh, Governor Ensley there, just to his 
left, I guess. And uh, she was a retired teacher. She taught the Holocaust for 20 years and thought that her Holocaust lessons were really one of the most important parts of her education and curriculum. And she really wanted other teachers to have this, what she considered a gift. And so she went to her state legislator and she asked them to work with her and the legislator came to us and we all worked on this legislation, which again, encourages Holocaust education. It also directs OSPI to work with a Washington state nonprofit um, dedicated to Holocaust education. And so that is really one of the reasons that we're doing this program today. And it's why we have this incredible partnership with OSPI right now. And um, again, across the state, we are really anxious to provide our resources to educators throughout the state. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Paul Ruggleberg. Paul is uh, the teaching and learning coordinator, excuse me, learning and teaching specialist at our center. And he is a wealth of knowledge. He's the person many of our teachers call when they have questions. Uh, we really try to provide a lot of support as you're teaching and as you're adapting these lessons. You're always welcome to call, email us, and talk to us and get instruction along the way. And Paul might be one of the people you talk to. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul. Thanks so much, Dee. I appreciate it. And thank you, Akiva. Uh, as uh, was indicated, I'm the teaching and learning specialist for the Holocaust Center for Humanity. And that uh, I came to this role basically after the Holocaust education law came into effect in April 2019. And uh, that followed a career as a, as a lawyer for a number of years in the Midwest. And then I was a teacher in the inner city of Chicago, the inner city of Buffalo, and then here in the state of Washington, in Spokane and in the Kent School District. So I'm happy here to, today to try to explain to you a little bit or show you a couple of things regarding what the legislation is, what our role has been in relation to the legislation, and, uh, and then we'll introduce you to our special guest uh, Holocaust survivor, Peter Metzelar. So I'm just gonna share a screen here. Bear with me one moment. Okay, so as you can see, this is the law. So SB 5612 went into the law that was passed, RCW 28A 300.115. And essentially, you know, I'm not gonna read the whole part. I'm gonna sort of indicate to you what it, what it practically means. For one, unlike about 12 states in the country right now, uh, which mandate Holocaust education, Holocaust education is not mandatory as of this point in our state. However, it is and it isn't in a way. It's strongly encouraged to be taught from basically <clears throat> upper elementary or middle school up through all public high schools. However, as you can see in this part right here, that, um, let's see, here, in the, uh, number three, that beginning September 1, 2020, middle schools, junior high schools, and high schools that do offer instruction regarding the Holocaust must follow the best practices and guidelines developed under subsection two of this section. So basically what this law uh, did was OSPI essentially contracted with us to do these two things. One was to create best practices and guidelines for teaching about the Holocaust. Those are all contained, um, I'll show you on a, our website there, and they're further hosted uh, on OSPI's website. And then the second part of it that I'll explain a brief bit to you is that is the outreach part of it. Our attempts to basically connect this with uh, the many school districts and schools and teachers in our state. So first, the best practices. So I've essentially been going around and, uh, you know, trying to... Uh, to speak and to connect with the various teaching and learning directors and assistant superintendents in, in all of the districts in the state and have had tremendous success with many of them where we're really working deeply. I've essentially you know, uh, done approximately 40 uh, professional development sessions for a number of the districts, in some cases, several sessions per district. And uh, those include Spokane, Tacoma, Edmonds, North Shore, Puyallup, Battleground, Evergreen School District, the Archdiocese of Seattle, and many, many other districts and, and private schools even. So the best practices, essentially, this is what it looks like on our website. 
and in the OSPI website, it would further direct you here as well. We tried, we vetted this across many, many different educators, and we really put a lot of thought and effort into making this accessible and user-friendly, whether you've taught about the Holocaust for a little bit, a lot, or never at all. Of course, many teachers have never taught about the Holocaust, and so maybe in their school or district, now they're being strongly encouraged or asked to do so. And so we wanted to make sure there are resources there for everyone to use where they don't have to be overwhelmed by such difficult, complex history. So uh, to do so, real quickly, um, uh, you can see the way that it's organized here is thematically and chronologically. This panel here on the right side is essentially an annotated table of contents that would direct you into sort of specific facets of um, Holocaust education. Those things include overview lessons, if you are short on time or if you, the teacher, are just looking for a quick introduction so that you can help convey important information for your students, uh, and also deeper dives. And that, uh, in addition to that, we also include specific recommendations and teacher guides, et cetera, for Holocaust literature. Um, now, this here, uh, this graphic here on the right side is, has turned out to be extraordinarily popular in the many PD sessions that I've been doing for people because it kind of like makes sense, like giving a picture for those of us who are visual learners. It gives us a picture so that we can like wrap our heads around, okay, well, what does this all mean? So I'm gonna click that in a second and briefly walk you through it. But I also wanna mention one other thing because when we were vetting this across so many other, uh, uh, so many teachers, uh, you know, like I say, across the state, um, Everyone was so helpful and gave us some good tips and some input and feedback, but one thing that several of them asked for is like, okay, this is all so amazing, but, you know, there's going to be somebody who comes to this and says, gosh, this is great, but there are so many choices, there are so many things, can you just give us kind of like recommended outlines on what to do? So sure enough, we did that. If you were to click this link, you would see proposed outlines for teaching about the Holocaust through ELA and or social studies in increments of one to two weeks, three to five weeks, or even complete units. And those are sort of modified and adapted for upper elementary, middle, and high school. So that's all there. Everything there is hyperlinked. And of course, um, you don't have to follow those things, but they sure as heck provide an incredible starting point for teachers. And many, many people not only have really appreciated that and expressed that, but in fact, a couple of districts, namely Spokane and uh, Tacoma, have essentially outright adopted what we created and recommended for teaching through ELA, um, uh, eighth grade ELA, English language arts. Okay, so this graphic. This graphic hopefully makes it even simpler for you, uh, for anyone coming to the site. Okay, so essentially everything here is hyperlinked, and so that was on the best practices page itself, but this is kind of how it works. This is what we're asking people to do, what we're asking them to consider. First, it starts with the guidelines. You'll remember in the legislation it says develop best practices and guidelines, so I'll, I'll show you briefly the guidelines in a moment. So after considering the guidelines, sort of the do's and a couple of like caveats in there, um, the next step is to make sure that in any good um, lessons and any good uh, sequence of, uh, of lessons or a unit that we make sure, well, what is it that we hope our students will emerge from this learning with? You know, what are our desired outcomes? And so we give an incredible activity that I'm gonna very briefly preview for you about how that helps set the stage for your proposed outcomes as well. Importantly, some key terms and vocabulary. We also provide resources, again, hyperlinked here, making sure that we sort of pre-address before we get there, potential issues, you know, in, uh, immature or inappropriate behavior from some kids who think it's funny when they see a picture of emaciated people or somebody thinking it's interesting or cool to, for Pete's sakes, draw a swastika or to do a, a Hitler salute or something. So by using classroom contracts and even letters home and connecting with admin at the very beginning of any such units, this has been enormously successful for many, many teachers and certainly for myself and my own teaching. And not only that, that it sort of addresses like, you know, potential pitfalls, but conversely, it is a tremendous, <clears throat> excuse me, a tremendous uh, unifier kind of 
Uh, there have been so many times where I've started such lessons and by bringing the parents in, talking to them from the beginning uh, through a letter uh, about what our intentions are, why we're learning this and how we're going to do it, they get interested, they converse with their kids and it becomes a real family and community affair so that by the time we bring a speaker in, a survivor in uh, to speak, um, they wanna be there too. And so I've seen this time and time again and many teachers have that it's a tremendous, wonderful community opportunity, let alone just a classroom one. <clears throat> then a key is to provide um, histor accurate historical context and so we give specific recommendations hyperlinked here on how to do so. All of these things here can be done in less than two weeks. Even if you chose this or this or, or that or, or something, um, basically that sort of investment of time in the foundational lessons makes everything thereafter pop. Whether you're teaching it through history or social studies or art or English language arts, kids are going to be so desirous and so armed to make connections and to think about their place in this learning. And it's been really, really transformational. Uh, then as indicated before, we have recommendations. So once you do this context and everything, the rationale, um, the teacher chooses their path. Are they going to teach this through ELA? Here are recommendations. Are you going to teach this through history or social studies? And again, back on our best practices page to which this is hyperlinked, there are specific lessons such as answering questions of why didn't the Jews just leave when they saw the writing on the wall or to whatever extent they saw writing on the wall. Um, another one, which many students ask when they're doing this timeline activity that we recommend in step three, many students ask, <clears throat> what was the rest of the world doing during this? What was America doing during this? There are specific lessons, very interactive, very engaging that can be done remotely as well that help address that question and explain the numerous factors and considerations that right or wrong uh, impeded uh, the US and many, and almost every other country in the world's uh, uh, interests, shall I say, or intentions about whether or not they were going to engage and try to take on Jewish refugees. Uh, sadly, uh, ex extraordinarily few of them did. Uh, technically, there was only one country that did, the Dom Dominican Republic. Great Britain did have a, a kinder transport program that took on 10,000 children only. There were some U.S. rescue efforts that let in some Jewish people into the country, but there were quota restrictions and, and so many other things. So it's a real powerful lesson, um, America's response to the Holocaust, learning a little bit about the Evian Conference and such things as well. And then importantly, culminating work. By the t Once you establish this rationale at the beginning piece, uh, as far as what is it that we hope our students learn, they'll be continuously engaged in thinking about such questions throughout their learning so that by the end of it, asking students to participate and enter into something like our writing art and film contest. And on our website, there are additionally other recommended culminating uh, activities that really give students that opportunity to connect their learning to themselves, what they've learned, and then hopefully kind of uh, a vow or an intention as to um, their hopes to try to make the world a better place to help the, you know, enliven this idea that change does begin with me. So how do we do that? What's one way, what's one great way of doing it? Well, back on the legislation part here, I just wanna highlight this little piece here because I love it that the law kind of articulates the point of Holocaust education. Like any good history teacher knows that you don't teach history just to teach history or just to check boxes or X, Y, Z, or this happened in, 1875, et cetera, et cetera. Importantly, it's what can we learn from it? And so the law gives voice to that. It specifically indicates that the studying of this material is intended to examine the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and intolerance, prepare students to be responsible citizens in a pluralistic democracy, and be a reaff reaffirmation of the commitment of free peoples never again to permit such occurrences. Okay, so how do, we, how do we do that? Okay, so mo basically all of the lessons, all of the best practices lessons give voice to that, sort of uh, really bring that into relief. 
However, the greatest thing that I recommend is right at the beginning, right? We want bookends. We want to establish the rationale. We want the culminating work on the end. And so as I indicated before, the, as a, a, an incredible activity or lesson to utilize uh, stems from this pyramid or potential escalation of hate. The activity itself is on our website. It, there was an, a version of this originally created by the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, and then Echoes and Reflections did some adaptations. And then we have sort of uh, uh, modified it slightly to include some of our own primary resources of local survivor testimony, clips, and primary source images to really make this lesson deep and broadly applicable to students uh, learning about this in our state. So the Pyramid of Hate can be, it, it, as a lesson, it can be done in a day or two tops. And uh, essentially it begins in the beginning, well, it, it begins essentially with vocabulary. So the first part of it is making sure that students understand and come to grips with some of this imp these important terms that you can see right away. They are hardly specific to the Holocaust alone. They are rather uh, general and universalized towards hatred in all of its forms. And really that's been a real game changer for many educators who more narrowly had initially thought that teaching about the Holocaust is teaching about the Jewish experience or what happened to Jewish people. But suddenly a lot of light bulbs go on and they see, gosh, I can connect this to To Kill a Mockingbird or The Hate You Give and African-American Studies or with Since Time Immemorial and make a real incredible powerful narrative of issues of hatred, bias motivated violence, even genocide and what our role is in the face of that. So by initiating and instilling this type of vocabulary with an activity to allow them to practice and to apply, then importantly, one of the important guidelines of, of teaching about the Holocaust is to provide an accurate definition, which is always mind blowing to students when they see the breadth of the victims, when they start to ask questions, why? Or wait a minute, there were Germans of African descent, what was that experience like? So sort of like engaging students with almost a, a series of questions and these prompts here, maybe a parking lot and word wall and things like that so that even when you don't know the answers to the question, it becomes sort of a discovery process, uh, an, an, an inquiry slash discovery process throughout the learning of this education so that as they go through and do more of these activities and learning, they will start to come to many answers and thoughts uh, uh, in answer to the questions that maybe they were posing at the front end. But when we get to the pyramid of hate, I just wanted to show you this. So there's, there's numerous hyperlinks in here that give student-friendly printouts or shareables that you can ask the students to um, write right on or work together with. And there are two options. One is basically a Q, discussion Q&A. And the second one does, as I indicated before, include some of these amazing primary source materials. So um, how it works essentially is after students have had the opportunity to take a look at, and I'll use this image again because it's a little easier to see, after they've had an opportunity to consider some of these things and they look and you ask them, what do you see as a relationship? You know, first they'll define and they'll think, okay, can you think of examples in today's life that might apply? What are biased attitudes? What are acts of bias? Then after a little bit, you ask them, you step back and say, okay, what if any relationship exists between the layers that you see on this pyramid or escalation of hate? And invariably, someone will inevitably say, hmm, it seems like they're all related, but it seems like the higher up you go, the worse things get. And that's, that's where you want students to be then before going into the discussion Q&A or the use of the primary sources as indicated here. So for example, then what you would do as prompted here, and there's the handout to share with your students that includes all of these links that you'll see. Here are a grand total of about eight different uh, links. Some of them are images. Some of them are one to two minute long testimony clips. And for each as it instructs, um, it asks students to consider, okay, watching this video here or seeing this image, which layer or layers of the pyramid are impacted and why? 
And so it's great because use is kind of a, a beginning and introductory lesson. It sets the stage, it sets the table. Students who've never learned about the Holocaust or don't know anything, this is kind of an, a real amazing introduction. So all of a sudden they're like, holy cow, this is unbelievable. And they start to meet people, which is a key to Holocaust education, which is the stories, trying to transform statistics into actual human stories and the lives that were lost, implicated, and damaged forever. So um, everything that we do in this lesson uh, connects this idea of the past to the present. What examples do you see today? So here's one example. Sadly, I don't have time to like share this with you right now, but you can see it's just under two minutes long. And students would watch this testimony of Eva Tannenbaum Cummins as just one example. And in that they would see two, maybe even three of the layers of the pyramid impacted, which is mind drop uh, uh, blowing to many. And then of course they're connecting it uh, with things that they see in today's world, sadly. So by the end of it, they are asked here, which is the most powerful piece of all after they've gone through this, what if anything can we, individuals like you, individuals like me do to stop or negate hatred from moving up the scale? And of course, we want to be careful. Just because you have biased attitudes of acts bias, of course, does not guarantee that it's going to lead to genocide. It is a potential escalation. What happens in a society where we allow, accept things, and do not do anything to check hatred? Hatred, hatred and intolerance and bigotry and prejudice become so normalized that they become conditions precedent to worse and worse acts, such as what we saw in January such as what we've continuously seen, sadly, that include bias-motivated violence, and in, sadly, too many nations, even since 1945, genocide. So, incredible lesson. If anyone is interested in further professional development, if you're one of the districts or schools that have not connected with us, please email me, contact me. I'm happy at any time, whether it's this spring, late summer, early fall, to come in and do a sort of co-learning session with you. And um, yeah, that's what I do and I'm happy to do it. Okay, so that leads me into one of the other great, uh, uh, one of the greatest resources and one of the most long-standing resources of the Holocaust Center, which has been in existence for over 30 years now, and that is our Speakers Bureau. So through survivor testimony, as Akiva, as Akiva mentioned earlier, um, survivor testimony not only um, essentially guarantees that your students will never forget these lessons because it is such a powerful, impactful thing to have a survivor or a legacy speaker, which is a child or grandchild of a survivor, come into your classroom, either virtually or in person. But in addition, um, as the Echoes and Reflections survey showed, it helps dramatically increase critical thinking skills as well, which of course, having been a teacher for as many years, I can certainly attest that I was always asked about data, data, data. And I always just sort of winked and said, you don't worry because with these engaging lessons, data takes care of itself. You get the most reluctant readers, ELL students, et cetera, et cetera, kids who hate reading, suddenly become so interested. They wanna read, 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 graphic novels, speak about it, amazing. And then the culmination to me and for many teachers is to bring in a survivor. And one of our greatest and most long-standing survivor speakers is Peter Metzelar. Um, so at this point, I'm going to introduce you to, to Pete, who is here with us. And Pete was born in Amsterdam, uh, uh, Holland in 1942. When he was just seven years old, the Nazis seized Peter's entire family, except for him and his mother, who ultimately hid on a small farm in Northern Holland, first with the Post family, and later with two women in The Hague. Peter, his mother, and just one aunt uh, were the only survivors of his family. After the war, Peter immigrated to the United States in 1949. He became a radiology technologist, ultimately settling in Seattle in 1997. Peter has been a speaker, as I indicated before, uh, with the Holocaust Center for Humanity for so many years and has spoken undoubtedly to more uh, educators and students and community groups than I think any other survivor in the Holocaust Center's history. And having seen him on multiple occasions myself, 
such a powerful speaker. Peter, thank you so much for joining us here today, and I can't wait to help share with those in attendance today uh, your story. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate uh, the introduction. I will say you gave me a little extra time and age. I was born in 1935, <laughs> which is just uh, absolutely great. But one of the things that I'd like to start off with that I happen to be one of the uh, fortunate, fortunate people relative to the number of people that Jewish people that got murdered, which you heard of course, 6 million and 5 million non-Jewish people. In addition to that, uh, next picture, please. In addition to that, relative to the small country of the Netherlands or Holland, at the end of the war in 1945, between 75 and 80 percent of the 140,000 Jewish people were murdered. 75 to 80 percent. Uh, during that time, every country that the Nazis occupied they instituted rules and regulations to be adhered to by the Jewish people. It was referred to as the Nuremberg Laws. There were many of them. I'd like to just go over uh, one of them that most people are familiar with, which was to require every person of the Jewish faith, anytime they came out of their living quarters, to wear a bright yellow star on their outer garment. Within that star, it had the word Jew. If you lived in France, it would say Juf. In Germany, Jude. In the Netherlands or in Holland, it was Jod, J-O-O-D. Now, even to the point of six-year-old, down to that age, next slide, please. Down to the age of six, as you've seen this picture a little earlier, kids were required to wear that particular star. My family, mom, dad, and I, we lived in an, an older building in, uh, in Amsterdam, and it became in a very short period of time after the Nazis occupied that people started to disappear, including family members. They were either called up by an order and they never came home, or they were arrested on the street, areas of their park, whatever. Nobody knew what actually happened. A number of years ago, I, uh, when my mom was alive, uh, I visited her and I found a box of old photographs. Among them was a picture of my mom. Next picture, please. Which you can see in her early 20s, middle 20s, uh, wearing a star that was on the coat. Uh, when I flipped the picture over, it had a trembling piece of paper and there was one of those stars. And I said, mom, where did you get that? She got very irritated. She says, I don't know, I don't remember, but at the end of the war, I just ripped it off my coat. This is the actual star that was on the coat. And those of you who will have the opportunity to visit the Holocaust Center for Humanity, uh, this photograph and star is on display. I donated to, uh, that to them. As I mentioned, more and more people started to disappear. And as in every country, you have good, you've got bad, but there were people that basically took the attitude, nothing to do with Jews, nothing to do with anything else, but take the attitude, who are these Germans coming across our border and taking our citizens away? They were forming a so-called underground. It developed into a more organized organization later, but in the beginning, it was one person in one block to in another. And they would just do for the Jewish people that they couldn't do them for themselves. Such as the Germans over, took over the food production in the Netherlands for their military. So the citizens were given stamps to buy food. Not all citizens, the Jews were. So some of these underground people, they would you know, manage to get food, false identification, but most importantly, most importantly, find places that they could hide families of people that would shelter a Jew. So as more and more people disappeared, including my aunts, grandparents, uncles, uh, my dad to be the last one, uh, which he was arrested in June of 1942, and that's the last that we ever heard of him. Uh, my mom somehow contacted, found out one of these people that ended up, one of those underground people, and they ended up uh, finding a uh, couple in a, uh, a farm couple in the northern part of, uh, of the Netherlands. Uh, next picture, please. Klaus and Rufina Post. 
This is an actual picture of them as I remember them. Uh, again, I was only seven and a half, eight years old when we came to the farm. This is a picture of the actual farm. It was small. They had a couple of cows, couple of pigs, couple of chickens. They worked their finger to the bone from sun up to sun that sunset uh, on, on small acreage that they had, raising veggies. And it was always amazing to me that they would take us on. We'd never heard of them. They'd never heard of them. It was a devout Christian family. They didn't care who, what religion. They just felt a wrong was being done. So we went on that farm. When we got to that farm, it was already very old. It was probably 30, 40 years old. It didn't have electricity. It didn't have indoor plumbing. You had to use toilet facilities. You had to go outside <clears throat> to, you know, to an outhouse. And they shared their heart. They would sun up, sun down, sun down. Uh, and they worked and toiled and they shared their food. They were compassionate. They were, they were just, just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. But like as the war continued, the Germans started to find out that Jews were being hidden on the farms and now the trucks came. They started to ransack these farms, kicking over furniture, looking every which way. When they found somebody, they were arrested, put on a truck. Again, who knows? Nobody knew where they, where they ended up. So one day Klaus did an interesting thing. On the bottom, uh, the floor of the farm, was knotty pine, 12 inch knotty pine board. He took a saw in one of the joints and he cut two 12 inch pieces open. When you opened it up down below, and I say the dirt within a couple of feet, that was all there was. Now, when mom and I heard the trucks coming, we jump into this hole. It was scary. Klaus and Wolfina would put the boards back on. We would be a foot and a half underneath the floorboard. And when the Germans started to ransack and go through the farmhouse, they'd again be a foot over my head. All it would have taken is one sneeze, one cough, one hiccup, it would have been all over. It got there too dangerous. So one day, Klaus told me to get a wheelbarrow and some shovels. And only a couple of hundred feet from the farm was a, was a half an acre of trees. And I want to mention that he told me to do this at dusk. The reason I mentioned the word dusk is the fact that in the almost two and a half years that my mom and I were on that farm, we could never come outside during daylight hours. The reason being, of course, there were other farms. You have traitors, you have uh, enemy conspirators. Somebody would see us if we were to go out and they'd say, hey, who are they? Uh, 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 that couldn't happen. We lost all identity, our souls. We didn't, we could not be seen by anybody. So it could only come outside for fresh air when it started to get dark. And on this occasion, the uh, class told me to get the wheelbarrow. We went into this little forest and we dug a hole into the side of a hill, three feet wide, three feet tall, six feet deep. Class went out of the area, cut down some trees over the top, interwove some, uh, some twigs in the front as an entrance. You could stand in front. It just blended in with the nature. You couldn't see anything. Now, when the trucks came, mom and I would run out. We would run out into the forest. We'd crawl through the twigs that kind of snap back in their place. And we would barely fit in there, barely fit into this dirt hole. We couldn't see out, but we heard all the racket. And two, when they were uh, uh, ransacking the farm, two things that I remember so clearly that just scared the living daylights out of me. One was, as mom and I were just body to body in this hole, dirt always came trickling down. I was always scared, you know, it would cave in. But the thing that scared me more than anything else, I was aware that I am being hunted. I'm only eight years old. Why, what did I do wrong? And here was the thing, I could hear them ransacking the farm, yelling, carrying on. I couldn't see them because we were in this hole. And what scared me is at this time, they're gonna come and get me. What did I do? What is wrong? What are we doing in this hole? Where's dad? Where's grandma? I could just never understand. It was so, so scary. Well, folks, I'm talking to you. Uh, they never did come. They never did come into, the, into this particular, into this cave. So as 
time continued. We were there for two and a half years. And in my mom's wisdom, she felt we had to find another place. The raids became more frequent. And she felt one of these days, we're gonna get caught, it'd be the end of us. But not only us, but those dear people, Klaus and Rofina, and their entire family would be sent to a death camp. The Germans wouldn't put up with somebody that was hiding a Jew. So once again, through the underground, they found a couple of women in the city of The Hague. They let us use one of their small rooms. To this day, I don't have any idea why they even did what they did, because it was totally different from the farm. They wouldn't share their, very seldom share any of the food with us. They wouldn't hardly ever share their stamps to get food. And as a matter of fact, there were a number of times, uh, several times, that mom at night disappeared for an hour. She'd come back with a loaf of bread. Don't ask. I have no idea. I don't know how and where did she get it. But we were hungry. Anytime there was any dirty work to be done, whether it was cleaning the floors or the bathroom, they'd ask mom to do it. Uh, it was so different from, from Klaus and Mufina on the farm, but we had to be thankful. After all, you know, they did give us shelter. And then came the day that mom said, Pete, you haven't been to school. I can't go to school. I'm one of them. The underground, we got some false identification for you. You're not Peter Metzelar anymore. You're Peter Pelt. It was with that name that created one of the greatest experiences of fear that I remember. Being psychologically aware that somebody wants to hurt me, somebody wants to do bad things to me. I have to be somebody that I'm not. I can't even be a person. And the star came off and I went into a public school in my mind, in the mind of a nine-year-old, basically, having been persecuted to the point of not being a human anymore, I felt that when I went to that school, that every kid pointed at me and said, hey, there's one of them. They didn't know who I was. I was just one of the guys, but the psychological pressure of that was really, really, really something. In the city of The Hague, something that some of the kids especially are not aware of, uh, Nazi Germany had a very brilliant young scientist by the name of Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun and his scientists developed a first in the world ballistic missile for war purposes. Next slide, please. It was called a V-2 rocket. It stood 65 feet tall with a two and a half thousand pound explosive and they predominantly fired them over to Great Britain where the bombers came from that were trying to wipe out Hitler's war machine. On the right, you see Dr. Werner von Braun in his civvies as I like to call in front of the butchers, the hierarchy of the military, he had to join the Nazi party to get financing to build from the military to build this thing. Well, they used to fire these up and the Brits of course weren't thrilled to say the least. Many Brits died in the process of these missiles that were fired from the entire west coast of Europe to England and other places. They used to come over and have dog fights to try and shoot down, bomb the launching facilities. It was on one of these particular times that that happened, that they came and they started to bomb these facilities and you had to go into a bomb shelter, you had to hide, you heard all the racket going on. And it was on one of these particular times after one of these raids that took place several times during the week that the actual, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after one of these raids that we came out of the shelters, I found a big grenade that we used to trade in class, like trading cards. And I found one of those, I was so proud of it. I showed my mom and she made, it was heavy to lift, was shrapnel, shrapnel from the bombs, from the anti-aircraft, whatever. She made me heave this thing away and 10 seconds later, there's an explosion behind me. The thing blew up. I have no idea what it was. It was live. Well, let's put it this way. To, uh, the raids became more and more frequent. There was a, a, a uh, meeting held in the city of Wannsee, south of Berlin, where the hierarchy of the military and the politician 
got a meeting and there came from in an hour and 20 minutes, the decision and what is referred to in the history books, they came up with the so-called final solution, how to eradicate every Jewish person from the face of Europe and from the world. And when that happened, those raids I keep talking about 24 seven around the clock, my mother found out, I have no idea how she ever did. I asked that many times that these ladies that got scared because of all of the rape, they were gonna turn us in. So we had to get out of there. I wake up one night and through, by the way, again, through the underground, they found a one room apartment back in Amsterdam, which is only about 45, 50 miles from The Hague. The only problem, there was only one highway at the time, no civilians allowed, strictly for military convoys. I wake up one night and my mom is sewing what looked like a bunch of sheets. What are you doing? Go back to sleep. When I woke up a couple hours later, she had made a nurse's uniform out of sheets, bed sheets. She said, we got to get out of here. She wrapped this contraption around herself. We tiptoed out of the apartment, really had no belongings to speak of at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we went in the snow. I said, mom, where are we going? She says, don't talk. Just be quiet. And we went through the snow after about 45 minutes. All of a sudden, I something dawned on me. I'm 10 years old now. I said, Mom, we're not going to that highway, are we? She says, Peter, we got to get to Amsterdam. I said, we can't do that, Mom. Please don't do that. I'm so scared. Those are the ones that want to, they want to kill us. Just don't talk. As daylight came up, we get to that highway and troops, German troops marching, tanks, artillery. I am petrified. And now as we get to the highway, my mom does something. As the expression goes, I know the doo-doo is gonna hit the fan. She sticks out her thumb and starts to hitchhike. I said, mom, what are you doing? Don't talk, Peter, be quiet. It wasn't a few minutes later and a flatbed truck stop. An SS officer gets out. The SS was the bad, the black uniforms, the worst of the worst, the ones that had the skulls on their caps. And this SS officer comes out and starts to read my mother the riot act. What are you doing here with the child? No civilians allowed. This is for the fatherland, blah, 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 blah. Here was my story, my mom's story. Sir, you know about the British bombing the V2 sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ish vices that. So she goes, well, the other day, one of the bombs went astray, hit the apartment house where this kid's parents and he lived in, it killed both of his parents. And I am, as you can see, I'm a nurse for the American Red Cross and I'm taking him to an orphanage in Amsterdam. The guy looked kind of puzzling. He grabbed my mother by the arm. I'm hanging on to her for dear life. She's my only security. And he leads her over to the truck. He puts her in, lifts her into the cab of the truck next to the other German officer picks me up, puts me in the snow in the back of the truck. Are you ready for this? I'm in the truck, I'm in the back, mom sits between the officer and they took us to Amsterdam. I get excited every time I get to that. The guys basically, they wanna kill us. Mom fooled them. They took us where we wanted to go. Anyway, it was a big thrill. <laughs> in Amsterdam, many things happen, of course. We don't have time for all of that, but what turned out is that not until the age of 58 did I start speaking of my story. I am 85 now. All of these years, what have happened? Never been back to Europe, never been back to the Netherlands. And one of my sons who happened to be, because of his work, lived in uh, Brussels, asked us to come over. It was a big thrill. We were over there. And the thing that always thought in the back of my mind, what happened to that little farm? What happened to those dear people? Was and Rufina Post. I had no idea where the village was. Anyway, we took a drive from Brussels to Amsterdam. If I recall, it's only about two and a half hours. We just became tourists. We took the canal cruise, visited the Van Gogh and Rijks Museum. And of course, we visited the actual Anne Frank uh, home. <clears throat> After we spent, I still understood the language just a little bit. I could read the advertise. It was a big thrill. And I went through uh, a, a, a map before we went over there to try and find something that could identify where were we in hiding. Mom didn't remember. She remembered a strange name. 
And I recall that was the name of the dirt road, but what are you gonna do to a foreign country and ask them about the dirt road? Anyway, I, I looked through these weird names, nothing jumped out of me. There was one named Matinka. Nah, not really. Anyway, we decided after several days in Amsterdam, drive another hour and a half north to this Matinka that really didn't mean anything. As we pull in, we stopped in this quaint little village and we stopped in another corner, corner bank. I felt stupid. I'm going to ask some lady, I'm in a foreign country, if she'd ever heard of a dirt road. Oh my gosh. I asked her, have you ever heard? She says, of course, sir. She says, it's five minutes from here. I said, no way. Oh my God, it was so emotional. We hugged, we cried. The manager came out and then he had a pensive look on his face after I told him basically what we're doing. I said, have you ever heard of the Klaus Post? Klaus and Fina Post family. He says, of course I have. I said, oh my gosh. I, of course, had to realize that they weren't around anymore. I said, what happened to them? He says, well, by the way, my trip over there was in the fall of 1992, the first time back to Europe. He says, they both passed away in the early 80s. Uh, I just feel sick about that. Why didn't I go back sooner and give them a hug? Thank you for saving my life. Anyway, they gave us directions. We drove up this dirt road and there it was. I recognized the farm. I had gotten bigger, you know, a lot of foliage after all 55 some years. Uh, I knocked on the door. I was hoping they'd be in. I wanted to go inside to see if I if they still had those those wooden planks on the floor that mom and I hid underneath. Nobody, nobody was home. It was like I was seven, eight years old again being there. And then I wanted to go into that forest just to see if there was a soft spot, a remnant that might indicate where that cave was. All four of us, my daughter-in-law, my son, my wife and I, we went into this fort, we split up. And it wasn't a few minutes later that my son called out, Dad, come here, I found it. Next picture, please. As we got over there, we go in, oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped one particular part. Of course, the, the war was over in 1945, my error, I jumped ahead of the game. And uh, nobody in my family returned. Well, my son called over, dad, I found it. And folks, there was the cave as I left it. It didn't have the, the twigs in the, in the front, of course, anymore. But there was that cave that mom and I spent so many frightening times in. On the left over here, I got a little screwdriver. I carved my mom and my initials in that blog. Unbelievable experience. We drove back to Brussels and something I always wanted to do when I had the opportunity to visit the site of a Nazi concentration camp. Everyone said, you know, what are you, some kind of a, some kind of a nut? I said, yeah, just ask my wife. I am. But anyway, we made the arrangements and we flew on lot of airlines to Poland, the city of Krakow. A beautiful, beautiful medieval city. However, a 20 minute drive outside of it beautiful medieval city was the most inhumane piece of hell that man ever created for man. Next picture, please, called Auschwitz-Birkenau. Next picture, please. When that came about, no, no, did we skip a picture? I am very sorry. Can we go back? I think we skipped, uh, we skipped one. Oh, what happened? I'm sorry. We're back to somewhere there. Uh, there was a picture of that camp. By the way, I'll just keep talking while we kind of get back to that. That camp covered 15 square miles. It's where the gas chambers were. It's where the crematoria were. And it was just unbelievable to see what took place. The trains came 24 seven. Thousands of people a day came to that particular camp. The old ones went right into the gas chambers. The ones that could still work uh, were in a situation where they went in a slave, came, slave labor camp. And uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the people, it's almost an oxymoron moron that said that survived there. Uh, how can a place like that, what took place there, survive? I guess we didn't, uh, didn't make the slides. I thought we maybe had that. But let me just go over uh, just a couple of things as we close out here. Uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize is propaganda that I always mention to, to the youngsters. The propaganda works. It is, for the most part, lies. There is some truth, but people have to distinguish which that. Oh, 
okay, here we go. This is the so-called area of selection after they get off the train. You went either to the left or you went to the right. As I mentioned, to the right, you went straight into the gas chamber, the old people. The other ones went into the slave labor camp. Go ahead, next slide, if you have it, uh, Paul. If you tell a big enough lie and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. I think we might have experienced this in modern history and maybe not all that long ago. And the important thing is that propaganda works because the person that said that was the person that Josef Goebbels, who was a cabinet minister in the Hitler regime for propaganda, that's all he did. He made that statement. Go ahead, the next picture, please. One of the things that is so important, there are people to this day that said, you know, this, this event never happened. Oh, really? It really did not happen? Well, the so-called deniers are biggest bigots, their races, their opinions, discard facts. The Holocaust, one of the largest documented and recorded events in history. And here you see a picture of Dwight David Eisenhower, who was of course the architect of the D-Day landing, not to mention the 34th president of the United States. And he wanted to go with his troops as they liberated some of these horrific death camps. And as it states, at the end of World War II, Eisenhower made a decision to personally visit many concentration camps as he put the reason he wanted to document the camps and their appalling condition. The thing that amazes me to this day, that 75 plus year ago, he anticipated a time when Nazi atrocities might be denied. So he wanted to document with reporters, 80,000 feet of moving film. Unbelievable that he had that kind of forethought. Next picture, please. And then we will, let's see, I think we have the old one. Let me just basically finish and I'm hoping for tolerance. Difference is okay. And the thing that I emphasize so much is independent thinking. You know, the world as we created it, uh, you know, it's a product of our thinking. And in so stating that it can't be changed without changing our thinking uh, to maintain a tolerant society. The society must be intolerant of intolerance. The last thing I wanna say, the value as I have spoken to thousands of kids over the last 20 some odd years, I get thousands of letters. I just happened to pick out one that I like to read. It's a very short one that one of the kids wrote to me. Dear Mr. Peter Metzler, I am a student at such and such a high school. I don't want to sound rude, but I was a person who didn't believe in the Holocaust. But after I heard your story, I knew deep in my heart that you were being honest and it was the truth. Thank you so much for sharing the story. It was really, I was really interested and I hope I can keep, the, and I hope that you can keep the good work. I have so many things, so many letters over the years that came up with this kind of a thing that we felt, you know, that education is part of today's world. Thank you so much for allowing me to tell a short portion of my story. Thank you so much, Pete. And I feel I can speak for all of us here that we are just so honored uh, to have you here today for you to share your experiences and your strength, your resilience, your mother's resilience, just truly impressive. impressive and I'm never gonna forget this experience myself. Um, so now we'll have some time for question and answers uh, with any of our presenters here today, but I would highly encourage you to ask Pete a question while we have him here uh, with us today. And I uh, also want to know and communicate this to you and Pete made sure that I knew this, that no question is off the table. Anything goes here. This is a space for learning and erasing ignorance and exploration of truth and memory. So please do not refrain if something pressing enters your mind. 
And uh, please answer all your uh, questions into the chat. That way I'll be able to go through and ensure that it's done in an orderly and uh, timely manner in these last few minutes of our webinar here. So if you'd like to have a question for uh, Peter here, please enter it into the chat. Just seeing so much support and uh, appreciation, Peter, for you being here. Uh, here's a question. Thank you, Peter. This is from Sylvia. What made you decide to share your story after all these years? Oh, that's that's a, a, just just a wonderful, wonderful question. It comes up many, many times, and it was after that experience, after not having been, after having been in a in a new life, given the opportunity that I went back to Holland, finding the farm, visiting in death, the, the death camps. After I saw all of that, I figured, you know, the inequity, the in, injustices that were being done, the horror because of bias, because misinformation, that I just felt that it, if, there, if what I am telling was the truth, it was my own personal story as I remember it. So it was just a matter of, relating that to people and hopefully to tie it into the horrors that still exist in the world today. Thanks, Pete. Another question, uh, which Paul passed along to me here. Someone asked, uh, what was he possibly doing to keep from going crazy while I'm hiding for two and a half years? Uh, again, all of the questions are great. Uh, again, I keep in mind that when it all, all broke loose, uh, I was uh, five years old, you know, by the time it was over, I was 10 and a half on the farm. Uh, I remember class making little homemade toys that I would play outside. Mom would read stories. I mean, I, you know, I was a little kid. I just went along. Mom was my only security. And it wasn't a matter that I could say, hey, I'm going to plan every day out all I know. I didn't exist for the rest of the world and I just had to accept it. Uh, Mom said so and the conditions under which we were there were very clear that I just, you know, keep quiet, don't be seen, don't be heard. Thank you, Pete. Uh, one question here from Alex Hillis. Did you ever find out what happened to your father? Absolutely, absolutely. After we visited Auschwitz, for those people that may have visited it, you know, there is a museum. And I wrote a letter to him. And all I did is mention my dad, born in Amsterdam in 1914. And I got a letter back. I got a letter back in Polish. I don't read Polish, but I had somebody translate it. And it actually stated that he arrived in Auschwitz from a a uh, holding camp in the Netherlands called Westerbork. He arrived in Auschwitz on July uh, 17th. He perished in Auschwitz on the 14th at 2.30 p.m. on a given day. That is the kind of records that the Germans kept. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I have document documentation. This wasn't just a made up kind of an event actually signed by a so-called doctor on the day that he perished of starvation. And again, my grandparents, I inquired, they had no record. They had no record. I contacted in the Netherlands, there is an organization called the War Institute, History War Institute. When I wrote them, they said, they looked up the dates of my, of my grandparents, who were at that time both 58. Well, to me, this is hard to understand considering I'm 85 now, but at 58, those people were expandable. The reason that there was no history, the minute, the minute that they got on the train, they went right into the gas chambers. There was no more history with them. So yes, I did know what happened to dad. Thank you, Pete. Uh, next from Veronica Gallardo. Uh, in your experience in sharing this with others, what approach do you find the most effective in shifting mindsets? Is it in person, media, speaking opportunities, or teaching? Well, 
it's all of them. <laughs> it has been <clears throat> much more difficult, needless to say, because of COVID. Uh, I, I, you know, did many, many in-person presentations, uh, not only in Washington, but in Montana and Alaska. And it, it was just a matter of the fact that I am at this point still alive and many of the teachers have stated to me that they've gotten afterwards the kids saying, hey, he was, he was there, he was there, rather than, you know, in, 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 this was the big thing, I took advantage of that, that I am telling it from my heart, I'm telling it from my memory, and it is the young people that again, <clears throat> because of <clears throat> the discrimination, the anti-Semitism that exists throughout the world today, that they can research and look and find the truth. That is the biggie, the truth. Thank you, Pete. And this is a question, actually, I'll ask Paul this. Is there a, in the speaker's <laughs> encyclopedia, a place where Peter's entire story is recorded? Uh, Peter has, has given a uh, video testimony for sure, and there are not only many clips, but I believe the entire transcript of a, you know, of a portion of his story or most of his story. Um, yeah, that can be accessed directly on our website. And then once you click Speakers Bureau, or sorry, Encyclopedia, and then Peter Metzelar, you would see like a number of, uh, a, a briefer version of his story, as well as, um, you know, uh, photographs and other artifacts and things, and then in addition, various video clips. Thank you, Paul. And I just put the uh, link there in the chat to Peter's entry there in the encyclopedia. Okay, additionally, uh, I have a question here. What are Peter's thoughts on our current and most recent political situation in the USA? It feels like we are headed down a dangerous path. So this is from Sally Bartlett. Uh... I wish I hadn't asked that. I hate to get political. The only thing that I have to say that the reality of today, unfortunately, kind of parallels many of the early days of the Holocaust. Many conditions have surfaced today. And there again, with the youngsters, that they can recognize the reality of things and that it is not just a story about 75 years ago, but how it can relate today, how it can relate to that. Thank you, Peter. And I, uh, let's see here. One question, for, another question from Sylvia that I thought was powerful. Your mother was so amazing. How do you try to honor her resilience and strength to save her child? How did she, I'm sorry. How do you try to honor your mother's oh. strength and resilience? Well, the point is that I can never, <clears throat> can never ever do that. Uh, it is impossible anymore that when I think back of the Klotz and Rufina people, uh, Post family, that at that particular time took their, uh, took their lives into their own hands to do it, uh, to, save, to save me. I will say from the standpoint, maybe I can just carry this over. Needless to say, my love for my mom uh, she passed away uh, in 1983, uh, 1993. Uh, so many memories of that. Uh, I have to say that I was very fortunate after a lot of research and a lot of writing in the city of Jerusalem is the world's largest uh, memorial uh, museum called Yad Vashem. Uh, they have a uh, area called the uh, nation of the righteous. They're large walls that actually have the names of people that saved other people. And I was able to get both Klaus and Rufina's name inscribed over there in their honor. So that will be forever. Uh, they will be in my mind forever, as of course mom will be as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the righteous of the nations, and I encourage people to look up the Righteous of the Nations on online. You can actually see a full list and learn some more about the heroic uh, deeds that people did to hide Jews and other people who were um, trying to escape those atrocities at that time. Um, lastly, Pete, I think I'll ask you this. A lot of people in the chat have asked this, but do you ever plan to write a book about your experiences? 
Well, I, uh, there is one available at the Holocaust Center uh, about 10 years, nine years, 10 years ago. I wrote a memoir. It is uh, very short, it's double spaced. Uh, it, uh, it is available uh, uh, in, in, uh, at the Holocaust Center for Humanity. They stock them as well as, as from other survivors and other stories of survivors. Thank you, Peter. And so we're in our last minute here, and I just want to let you have the floor here if there's any last words you'd like to leave us with. Well, the last thing I guess I can enter the way I kind of end my school presentation, which is basically that I encourage the youngsters to stay with their education and look for the opportunities uh, to contribute toward making this a better world. Recognize falsehood, recognize truth, because if you are able to do something about a bad thing in whatever small way, do it. Because to stand by and do nothing really is not an option. Thank you so much, Pete. So that concludes today's event, and I'm going to uh, shut down the meeting here and stop our recording and uh, wish you all a very good rest of your week. Thank you so much again, Pete. Thank you, Paul and Dee from the Holocaust Center. And uh, I appreciate everyone here who is just to listen and ask questions, and I encourage you to engage with all of these materials on your, on your personal time as well. Thank you.